Well, it's absolutely brilliant to see so many of you out. I was going to say on a cold night, but at 10 degrees after about what feels like four weeks of snowstorms where I am, this is positively balmy in the beginning of spring. And if that seems excessively idealistic and optimistic, well, hey, that's common meal. I um, want to start by saying that it's not me that's due any thanks from the, the people in Edinburgh, North and Leith, Commonweal, it's the other way around. I am simply amazed at what has happened, simply by saying to people, listen, use Commonweal, the name, as an excuse to be active, to do something locally. And what's happening now is, I'm waking up in the morning in the newspapers, it says, the Glasgow Common Fest, and I'm saying to the team, is that us? They say, no, 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 that's Glasgow North. Or um, coming up soon in April, there's the, um, an entire weekend of Commonweal Festival in Perth um, for the Perth and Kinross group. And it's an amazing lineup. It's they've got some really, really good stuff going on up there. And once again, this has nothing to do with us. We're a team of 12 and we don't have anything, uh, any form of control, any form of um, guidance even to these local groups. What it shows is something which... I mean, I've got to say, for most of my life as an activist has been involved in these things, something which was like a kind of holy grail, which was enough enthusiasm of enough people to drive these things on their own, not to follow, not to join something, but to make something. And for all the great things that are happening in Commonweal just now, there is nothing for me personally that's more exciting than to see people who weren't active almost spontaneously become active and do things which, frankly, some of them are better than stuff that we could have done if we'd organised them with, with Commonweal. So thank you very much to everybody who's gone out to a local group. I didn't realise I was talking here. I thought I was only introing uh, Tariq. But I, I'm going to say uh, two of the things which I wanted to say if I had been uh, introing Tariq. One of which is, let us, none of us forget the many ways in which Tariq contributed to the independence campaign in Scotland. One of which was to give real important intellectual weight to support of a progressive vision for an independent small nation at a time when bluntly most people outside Scotland kind of thought we were a backwards campaign. It was incredibly important and it moved a lot of people. But the other thing which I think we should never forget is just how important the long-term uh, role that Tariq has carried out was to the Scottish independence campaign. Because I know all the people, Jonathan uh, uh, very much among them, who set up the radical independence campaign. And the majority of them were brought into politics during the Iraq war. And for so many of them, their first activism was reading Tariq Ali, realising for the first time often for a lot of them, they've told me, just exactly what a mess things were in. And that brought them in and it radicalised them and it made them want to do things. And when the independence campaign came along, my God, they did things. The radical independence campaign did probably more than anything else in my uh, time to drag the whole of Scottish politics to the left. It's been a wonderful uh, experience and we mustn't forget everybody's role from way back in bringing that generation of politicians in. Okay, I'm going to talk for very little because I've already talked for too much about nothing very much. Um, I'm going to talk uh, only for a little while about what we are doing in Commonweal to give you the quick introduction and then I'll go off. And if anyone's got any questions about any of this, then you know, ask them afterwards. But to be quite honest, I'm not hard to get a hold of. You can always drop me an email, robin at common.scot, if you want questions answered. And um, I want to make sure that we've got plenty of time to listen to Tariq. So I just want to tell you how things are going. Uh, brilliantly. <laughs> really amazingly. We've got a team of 12, uh, the, the, it's actually 13 um, if we include me. We're in offices in Glasgow and Edinburgh. We launched each of our different units uh, as we kind of went along. So I hope everyone's had a chance to see Common Space, which I love. I mean, bluntly, the, the National is great, but in the morning um, and all through the day, Common Space gives me news that I really want to read. It's been a while since I could get news I really wanted to read throughout the day, all day. So we've got an editor and, and, and the four journalists working in there, and they're doing an amazing job. And I think if there's something which, for me, symbolises what Common Space as a news entity is about, it was the Castle Tower campaign. Because that local authority, um, for any that don't know, it was Argyle and Butte Council, who, for reasons which are still a little mysterious, were doing absolutely everything they could to prevent a community buyout of our premises that was sitting empty for a long period of time. I have my doubts about why this is, 
But um, the community campaign fought really hard. And that local authority banked in the fact that, well, it's a local authority. Nobody notices. All they have to do is brazen it out and it will be okay. And what we did was investigated the bollocks out of them every day. We just phoned up and said, what is this council doing? Why is it doing it? What have they done in the past? Why is this happening? We contacted politicians and asked them to give us comment. And by the end of it, you know, almost every party political leader in Scotland was supporting that campaign. We'd uncovered a whole lot of stuff. Now, the result still went against the community group. And I suspect our Gale and Butte council think they got off the hook. <laughs> they didn't. We're not finished with them. And that's something which I absolutely adore, campaigning journalism that investigated people who do things to communities against their will. Who, who, who reports that? I mean, let's be honest, in Britain, there is barely a local newspaper that can survive without the advertising of its local authority. Remember that. When you read a local newspaper, almost all of them are reliant on local authority advertising and there's a limit to what they can do to hold their local authorities to account. So that gives an example of what you can do with real campaigning journalism. What's coming next in common space uh, is the social media element. So I, I'm sure many of you were involved in the independence campaign and it was an amazing experience. We educated ourselves as a mass of people and we largely did it in Facebook. Now, there are some drawbacks to that because can I tell you that my friends and family overseas are getting a little weary with infographics about Scottish monetary policy. They really just wanted to see photographs of my daughter. We need to have a place where we can build a large and sustained community of activists who talk, communicate, learn, organize. And that's what we're going to do with Common Space. Uh, we're only a few weeks away from launching it. It'll be, there will be a full social media function on that. You can join, invite your friends to join, share material, all the stuff you'd expect of a normal social media. But we have a specific organized function on it. And what that is about is making it as easy as we possibly can to start campaigns and build critical mass around them rapidly. So five of you want to start a campaign to save whatever, great. You start it there, you can build it up. And then we're integrating that into everything that we're trying to do with, with Commonweal. And I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but Commonweal is about doing stuff that wins. I am just sick to the back teeth of what has been a long, it feels like a long time in activist politics expecting to lose. And the feeling now that I don't expect to lose is the thing which makes me feel so positive as what, what's going on. In Scotland now, we expect to have um, a, super, a women's super prison abolished in three days. We expect now in Scotland to get fracking um, abolished in what, five days, six days? You know, this is what we expect now. We expect to be able to have that influence and it's an amazing thing. So we want to make sure that when people organise, we can help them get access to professional campaigning if it helps them. We've got a graphic designer who's there to make sure that things look good and are presented well, that we've got infographics on the internet. So if groups organise in common space and they need that service, that's fine, that's easy. Just ping us an email, we'll help with that. We've got a parliamentary lobbyist who's in the parliament um, three days a week lobbying on behalf of us and other organisations. So draw on that, that uh, resource. If you set up local groups or local campaigns and you need that, let us know we can do that. We can advise or help out in campaigning stuff. We've got a policy unit. So if you want to develop your stuff, uh, thoughts, ideas, policies locally, you can draw on that. Use that experience to help your campaigning get stronger. We're not an organisation. We're a resource. We're trying to make ourselves part of a community of people, and by creating that critical mass and bringing people in, we can do what the people that win do. There's nothing wrong with learning from your enemy. Our enemy is clinical. Our enemy throws money at political lobbying and campaigning and influence to get what it wants. So we can't throw money at it, but we can throw our enthusiasm, some professionalism, and a critical mass of people in place to do these kind of things, and that's what we're trying to do. There is so much going on in Commonweal. I, I genuinely can't talk about it all. Um, I'll mention a couple of things. The Red Lines campaign, I hope you've seen. I spent a week down in London talking to progressive left organisations down there, and I cannot tell you how much there is enthusiasm there is for what's happening in Scotland. They genuinely believe that we can send down a big phallic of radical politicians, radical MPs down to Westminster who will hold the rest of that parliament to account on a deal of making it work, of, of enable people to get their bills through, then Britain can change. 
They, there's a genuine feeling that that is something which Scotland can donate to the rest of the UK. And we are trying our very best. We're having great progress. We've spoken to the, the English Greens, the Scottish Greens, the SNP. Um, we've spoken to Plaid Cymru as well. And a lot of positivity for those red lines. If you haven't seen them, everything on allofusfirst.org. Um, another little thing that's it's not little, it's absolutely brilliant that's coming out, is um, an author, our, our first book from Common Print. So we've got a, a radical publishing arm as well. Um, our first book from Common Print is the first comprehensive history of the Scottish anti-World War movement, anti-World War I movement. It is a wonderful piece of work, carefully researched, and it's pulled together the stories of all the campaigners who campaigned against well, the conscientious objectors and the anti-war campaigners. Um, that should be out in the next two or three weeks, and we'll hold a public book launch, um, which is going to involve a discussion by a number of people about the meaning of um, the anti-war movement then and the meaning of the anti-war movement now. That should be, I think that's late March, if I can remember correctly. And so all I want to do now is just say, but none of this is the big project. The big project for us as an organisation right now is to set the agenda for Scotland as best we can for those years 2016 to 2020. This is such a crucial moment for us. Um, it was Leslie Riddick said to me at a meeting when we'd been talking and talking and talking for what felt like a long time about how we could make Scotland better. And she kind of turned around and said, do you think there's any chance we're marching everyone halfway up the hill? And my immediate reaction was, there's that risk we've got to get them up to the top of the hill. If we said we can make a better Scotland with a different politics, we've got to make it happen. We have to make it happen in 2016 to 2020. For those of us who still believe in Scottish independence, I firmly believe that the way we get it next time is to show them that this idea that an independent Scotland would be nothing but a pale imitation of Westminster is wrong. We have to be different now if we want to make the case for being different forever going forwards into the future. And so we are working to put together a proposal, I think there's about 35 major strands of this at the moment, which is going to cover things that we can do with the powers we have between 2016 and 2020 to transform Scotland. If we can get that together, he says, we should be able to get most of that together by the end of this year. We're hoping that what we'll do with that is the same thing we did the last time, which is take this incredible volume of work and put it together in a book, a simple book that anybody can read that says you want a different Scotland. Here is how we can achieve that in the next four years. We can drive those ideas. Uh, we've got everything in there from uh, municipal banking. We can have a local authority banking sector in Scotland any time we want to move people away from the failed commercial banking sector. National Investment Bank to invest in infrastructure. Large-scale, um, collectively-owned companies building energy devices installing energy storage right across Scotland. We've got proposals on ways to build a whole new generation of absolutely first quality, uh, first rate housing in the public rental sector in Scotland. Housing so good that young professionals don't want to buy overpriced houses anymore. Housing so good that they will choose to live in those houses and we can start to desegregate the housing market in this country. Bring people back together because the quality of public sector rental housing is where people want to be. These are just a couple of the ideas. There's absolutely loads of stuff that's coming through and we will be asking everybody, what are we missing? What more do you want to put in there? And frankly, what do you want to contribute? So that's what we're trying to do. It is a lot of work. It's an incredibly dedicated team. They do a hell of a lot of hours, and I'm going to put the, the fundraising plug in. And we're all in reduced salaries. They're modest salaries to begin with, and they're all in reduced salaries. We've been doing that since October last year to make this happen. But we need to make it a sustainable organisation. We need about another 500 to 1,000 people in Scotland who can give us that £5 a month, and we will be a sustainable organisation that's here for the long term. If we do that... Us and Women for Independence and the Radical Independence Campaign and National Collective and all of these legacy organisations from this most exciting time in the political history of Scotland, if we can all keep that energy and that momentum going, we may take us five days to beat the fracking. I think in the four years we can beat neoliberalism in Scotland. Thanks. <laughs> to take the mic. Thanks. Okay, um, first of all, thanks very much um, for the invite um, and also to pay tribute to the work that Commonweal has done 
um, all throughout the, the whole process because I think that what we've started to do and what Commonweal has been pivotal in doing is to start to redress the ideological balance when it comes to the question of neoliberalism. For so many years we've been told that there's no alternative. For so many years the Labour Party has been part of that attempt to put a stranglehold against there being any type of alternative to the system that dominates the politics in Westminster, the various financial institutions that surround it. And that's what's changed, I think, as a result of things like Commonweal. I've been asked tonight to say a, a couple of words about um, not just radical independence, but also the Scottish Left project. And before I do that, I want to say something more general about some framework issues which I think the movement not just in uh, Scotland and the UK but internationally faces. I was lucky enough to be one of a, a delegation of people from Scotland who went to Athens at the time of the election in Greece and to see the celebrations that took place in the square on the night of the election but also to see in people's faces and in the discussions that we had with activists in Greece the real sense in which people knew that the struggle was really just beginning. There really was a sense in Greece that people were exhausted by austerity, exhausted by the brutality of a system that meant that 300,000 people didn't have access to electricity, that people who did have well-paid, decent jobs beforehand were now living on the breadline, or worse. And... It was meeting those activists and the various social movements which surrounded the Syriza victory which gave us a lot of hope that despite the fact that we knew that the European Central Banks, the EU, the Troika would strangle the demo de democratic decision that was made by the people of Greece that they would still retain the possibility of there being a resistance to the austerity agenda. But the reason I mention Syriza to start with and the, the situation in Greece is twofold. It's first of all to say that solidarity on an international basis has to be more than rhetoric. It has to be more than saying simply that we stand with the people of Greece. It also has to match reality politically. And one of the problems I think that has faced Syriza is the lack of allies that they've had in Northern Europe. That yes, there are particular forms of resistance emerging in Southern Europe, but actually in Northern Europe, we also have to up our game in terms of how we're developing an anti-neoliberal consensus. We've also seen the opening of another front in Southern Europe with Podemos, a manifestation which begins in the squares that were occupied against the corruption of the banks, against austerity and so on. But that development has been important. It's now in a situation where people even on the right in Spain are beginning to come round to the idea that actually there is a question now about democracy versus austerity. The two cannot coexist. And what we've seen happen is that the austerity agenda in places like Spain and Greece have actually come up against the parameters of, demo of, of capitalism. That actually an austerity agenda driven by a neoliberal consensus means that if you decide to vote against it, there will be someone above you in the European context to crush your dreams, as the people in Greece actually say. So where does Britain fit into all of this? Well, we have to say, first of all, I think is that the crisis of the British state is a long crisis. And actually, I think is one which is terminal. Because if you look at the run-up to the referendum, we've talked about it extensively in terms of the amount of fear-mongering, scare-mongering, and these sorts of things. I do think that they thought that had they won the referendum, even if they didn't win it on too wide a margin, I do think they thought that the movement would have went to bed. I do think that they um, considered the fact that the coherence, that the ideological and political will to keep striving for an independent Scotland would dissipate. And what's fascinating, I think, about the polls that we're seeing just now is that actually the 45% of people who voted for independence are remaining not just interested, not just in some way coherent intellectually about the question of Scottish independence, but are actually still here and active in a variety of ways. And a lot of this has went, of course, to the SNP, but actually the diversity of movements expressed by this meeting tonight and a whole host of, of meetings 
is actually managing to retain itself. And if you want to find out how deep I think the crisis of the British state is, just look at the pages of The Spectator, where Fraser Nelson and others who today put a tweet out saying he would rather live his lifetime under a Labour government as long as it was part of the union and never see a Tory government again than to see Scotland leave. This is Fraser Nelson who you know, we all know about. The point is that we're on the verge, I think, of another political earthquake coming uh, around the general election, which is stretching, I think, almost to breaking point the first-past-the-post system, not just in Scotland, but in England, which is stretching to breaking point the idea that Westminster, this corrupt palace of millionaires, can in any way represent the hopes and aspirations of the people in Scotland and, and in England as well. There is an explosion, I think, a political explosion waiting to happen. And it's not just the government, it's not just the state, it's its associated institutions. It's the media, it's the banks, it's the corporations, it's the corruption which seems to run right throughout every thread of political and social life in the UK. And therefore the crisis they face is multifaceted. They face a whole series of fronts at the moment. And when I say they, I mean not just the Tories, but the leadership of the Labour Party, who seem to be struggling to try and find some way to relate to people, but they've already went too far. I think they are going through the same process that PASOK went through in Greece. In other words, that the crisis of the Labour Party is not just a one-off, it's not just something which is calibrated by existing circumstances, but is something which is terminal. There has been an organic shift in terms of the relationship between the Labour Party and working class people. And it's most intense in Scotland. While all this is happening, and I'll just make one or two last points. While all this is happening, the other, I think, important aspect of the crisis of the British state is its lack of ideological coherence. There is no uniting ideology that binds together the various strands of society behind the British state, and so they've had to resort to scapegoating. They've had to resort to divide and rule, the classic um, strategy in this kind of situation. And I want to say tonight something which I think is important. One thing they have been doing for years, since I've got involved in activism around the anti-war movement, one thing they have been doing resolutely is to demonize the Muslim community. They have been doing it time and time again, they want to generalize what happens with a tiny, tiny minority of people to an entire community because it suits their geopolitical and domestic agenda. And we have to say, I think as a movement, as in a movement for Scottish independence in general, we have to say that we stand with the Muslim community against any attempt to stir racial hatred. We stand with the Muslim community and we say also this, you do not have to apologize for anything because you are fellow citizens and part of our society. That's a message that we need to send through. And you know, it's not, always, it's not always easy to say that when you're faced with the barrage that comes from the state and from the media. But I tell you this, it's a slippery slope if we don't say it. Just look at the situation which emerged among sections of the French left who didn't rise to the occasion on this question. We are for solidarity between communities. We are for a multicultural society that thrives on democracy and that thrives on the common wheel. The last point, therefore, is this. What tasks do we now face here in Scotland as a movement? Well, I think that given the state of the Labour Party, that given the need to rejuvenate trade unions, given the, the possibilities which lie before us politically in relation to the fragmentation of the British state, in relation to the erosion of support between its traditional base and the Labour Party, that here there is an opportunity. And here I think there is a debate to be had. There is not, of course, unanimity on this question, but I'd simply say this that how much stronger a situation will be, be in 
if at the next time there is a referendum, the opposition to the SNP is pro-independence, is radical and is official, that we are the main opposition, that we are the people in Scotland who are progressing a radical agenda, a pro-independence agenda, and we've left Labour on the sidelines. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we need to think about how we can coordinate ourselves to replace the Labour Party from the left. To replace the Labour Party, not just through the SNP, but by raising the sorts of forces that are interested in this kind of idea that we've seen manifest throughout the referendum to say that we are now in a situation where at the next election in the Scottish Parliament we are electing as many radical left MSPs as we can in my view as part of some kind of coalition which allows us to say in the future that not only has the Labour Party been replaced, not only are we in favour of independence but the reasons that we are in favour of independence, those social issues which brought so many people into the movement are the guiding principles under which we move forward. And therefore, I suppose the last question is this. How do we create some kind of form or some kind of framework through which this kind of idea can be pursued? That's why, um, a, that's why the, the, the Left Project was set up to have that kind of discussion. A discussion which, yes, not everyone's going to agree with, but a discussion, I think, which is central to the ongoing legacy of the independence movement, which provides us an opportunity I don't think that we can miss. Thank you.